Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, uh, I rise today to read a poem written by Lionel Murphy, uh, Legion Branch 23, North Bay. He wrote this Remembrance Day poem, but sadly, Speaker, we lost Lionel just a month ago. He was 91 years old when he left us, and his poem is called On This Great Day. I wandered through the field today, a field of marble stone. So many young men laying there, some stones are marked unknown. They gave their lives that we might live the life we live today. Make sure the life they gave for us was not just thrown away. So many that have fallen in battle lost and won, so many young lives taken before their lives began. They fought for love, not for fame. For love of country, they lit the flame. They died alone or in a crowd. For those that did so, let's be proud. And now they lay in far off fields, their duty done, the torch is passed. We must not let their memory lapse and take the torch that they have passed. For if we fail to carry on, our liberty may soon be gone, and many lives will bear the cross of liberty that we have lost. Thank you, Speaker. Well here, here. Thank you. Uh, further member statements, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Today, MPPs are wearing purple ribbons to commemorate the seventh annual Shine the Light on Woman Abuse campaign, which takes place every November during Woman Abuse Prevention Month. The campaign was launched in 2010 by the London Abused Women's Centre and has spread to 30 communities across the province and the country. For the first time this year, Parliament Hill has joined the campaign, with the Peace Tower turning purple on November 15th. The campaign is more than just awareness raising about about the reality of men's violence against women, it is also a call to action. And I can think of no better action than to provide those who have experienced violence with the time they need to heal and to get the support they need without jeopardizing their employment. We know that the financial security that comes with a job is absolutely critical to enable abused women to feel they can leave a violent relationship. I have a private member's bill that will provide up to 10 days of paid leave for workers who have experienced domestic or sexual violence so they can see a doctor, talk to a counsellor, relocate or deal with lawyers and police. The bill passed second reading unanimously on October 20th and has been endorsed by hundreds of organizations, unions, experts and individuals who are calling on this government to bring the bill forward for public input at the Standing Committee on the Legislative Assembly. Speaker, this November, let's give Ontario women more than a purple ribbon. I urge this government to commit to making my bill a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Member. Famous member from Brampton, Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to stand today to talk about Minister Charles Sousa's visit to, my, to the city of Brampton this past week. M Minister Sousa was in Brampton while Minister Matthews was in Milton to announce our expansion of post-secondary education in both of these cities. I'm so proud to be a part of a government that's recognized a need, uh, a need for more post-secondary education and being in, uh, one of the most large, uh, one of the fastest-growing cities in. Canada right now, one of the top 10 fastest growing cities in Canada right now. I think that Brampton is excited for this opportunity and we're excited that this university campus or the partner that we search for is going to have science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics as one of their, as their focuses. These are the needs of students to create jobs for the future and to build innovation and structure for high skilled jobs in the days to come. Brampton is one of our fastest growing communities and this is why there was a call for this university proposal and we're so excited. Right now that our population of people between the ages of students between the ages of 18 to 24 is 50,400 and we anticipate it growing uh, up to 20 percent in, in the coming years education bringing education to the city of Brampton will not only help us build jobs create jobs build our economy and continue to invest in our province and our city but it also help us to continue to build Ontario up I'm so excited that Brampton has been given this opportunity and I look forward to working with all of our partners to continue to build Ontario up thank you mr. speaker thank you for the member famous member from Oxford 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today to recognize the third annual Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week. This week was created by my bill, the Hawkins Genic Act, which required Ontario homes with a fuel-burning appliance or attached garage to have a carbon monoxide detector. You cannot smell or taste carbon monoxide, so having a working alarm is the only protection against carbon monoxide poisoning. I would like to commend the hard work of our fire and emergency response services in getting this important message out in their communities. Last week, later this week, I will be joining the Woodstock Fire Department in a ride-along to deliver free pizzas to customers with working CO alarms. I've also heard of the great work being done by departments across the province, such as the Chatham-Kent Fire De Emergency Services CHIRP program, where firefighters provide free home alarm checks to residents. I would also like to recognize John Jinak, founder of the Jinak, Hawkins Jinak Foundation for uh, CO Education, and the un uncle of Laurie Hawkins, whose family was tragically lost to carbon monoxide poisoning in their home in Woodstock. John has been instrumental in increasing awareness of carbon monoxide alarms across Canada. If you haven't already, I encourage you to check your alarms and ensure vents and chimneys are clear and fuel-burning appliances are serviced. Carbon monoxide is the silent killer, but when you raise awareness about its dangers and the importance of working alarms, we can protect our families and save lives. And thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I encourage them all to get one. Further member speak, uh, statements, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure to talk about Hockey Helps the Homeless, which is a nationally registered charity that organizes one-day pro-am tournaments. Sports lovers, businesses, and volunteers come together to address the affordable housing crisis in a meaningful way. Over the weekend, I attended the Kitchener-Waterloo tournament, where upwards of $155,000 was raised with proceeds benefiting five local organizations that work with underserviced populations. A courageous young woman named Jessica shared her story. The support she received and services she accessed through One Roof Youth Services saved her life. The funding for One Roof's two supportive housing units dried up last spring, and the provincial government denied emergency funding despite knowing that the program helped at-risk youth stabilize their lives and build better futures by providing housing first. Jessica was one of 10 youth who had nowhere to go but the street as a result of these closures. Jessica has struggled with mental health, spousal abuse, as substance abuse, but she found solace and support at One Roof. And we need to remember that four youth died on the streets of Kitchener-Waterloo in 2014. She asked us, could you put a dollar sign on helping youth transition out of homelessness? Clearly, this provincial government concluded that the price was too high, and I was ashamed that our priorities were so out of line. Hockey Helps the Homeless tournament is possible because of countless volunteers who donate their time and energy to pull it off. I want to say a special thank you to Mel, Barry and Terry, Mel and Terry Berry for their volunteer hours over the years. They are amazing people, and we have a courageous and generous community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member, famous member from the Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was del delighted to visit Creative Village Studio, a storefront artist gallery and studio space in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore last month, to present them with my Gem of Etobicoke Lakeshore uh, Recognition Award in honour of their outstanding community service. Creative Village Studio offers art and photography classes as well as drop-in studio time for participants of all ages. And their vision is to provide a supportive place for artists with varying abilities in order to enrich their lives through creative expression. And they have certainly brought this vision to life through their efforts. Mr. Speaker, Community Living Toronto has supported thousands of individuals since 1948, helping them to find accessible and meaningful ways to thrive within the community, and whether this is through working in a supported environment or participating in uh, classes such as those at Creative Village Studio. And this organization can boast of more than 1,000 volunteers who play an active role in helping to integrate persons with an intellectual disability more fully, fully into our community. Congratulations to Harold Tomlinson, facilitator of Creative Village Studio, his staff, volunteers, and all of the program participants on achieving their Gem of Etobicoke Lakeshore Recognition Award in honour of their outstanding community service. And Mr. Speaker, some of the artists from this uh, program have actually been taken up by art galleries in downtown Toronto because of the quality of their work. 
Congratulations. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. If you come through Godridge this fall, you will have seen a beautiful array of 551 ceramic poppies, each one carefully placed on the lawn of the Godridge Cenotaph to remember each soldier from Huron County who sacrificed their life during the First World War. It has been exactly 100 years since these 551 soldiers, all part of the 161st Battalion, marched the streets of Godridge before travelling overseas to fight in France. This installation is an important reminder that we should never, ever take for granted our freedom and quality of life because men and women paid the ultimate price. Therefore, we must remember 365 days a year. But this installation, ladies and gentlemen, is also accompanied by positive messages. It brings with it uplifting stories about teamwork, volunteerism, and a vibrant community spirit. It takes a lot of people to carry out an extraordinary project like this. Thank you to the amazing Bonnie Sitter, a volunteer who suggested this special project for the 100th anniversary and who dedicated so much of her time and effort to the project. Thank you to local artist Ruth Ann Murner, who designed the poppies. Thank you to the more, more than 100 volunteers who rallied together this summer to make every single poppy and place them on the Cenotaph grounds. And to Rick Sick Sickinger, Huron County's Cultural De Development Officer, thank you for your outreach efforts that led to this installation, a work of art that has garnered both national and international rec recognition, lest we forget. Thank you. Thank you for the member's statements. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to bring attention to the dedicated education support staff working in my riding of Windsor West yeah. and throughout this province. They are the secretaries who are the gatekeepers to our schools, custodians who keep our schools clean and safe, our maintenance workers and IT employees, as well as campus ministers at Catholic schools. Students, parents, and education workers alike know the value that these professionals bring to our schools each and every day. In Windsor, support workers at the Windsor-Essex Catholic District School Board, represented by Unifor Local 2458, have been without a freely negotiated contract since 2012. Cheryl. They represent Cheryl. about 370 members throughout the area. Their last contract was forced upon them when the Liberal government imposed contracts on education workers through Bill 115. This is the same legislation that our court system deemed unconstitutional and continues to have repercussions on our education system to this day. Speaker, I'm not at the bargaining table, but I will say that I hope a fair contract that respects these workers and the value they bring to our schools is reached as soon as possible. Education workers represented by Unifor Local 2458 have been on strike for 16 days now, and I would encourage parties on both sides to work to bargain an agreement that ensures our schools receive the vital services support workers provide and as soon as possible. Thank you. Pardon, member statement. The member from Eglinton Lawrence. Mr. Speaker, I rise to pay tribute to Dr. Aldo Bacha, who passed away this Sunday, 7.30 a.m. Dr. Bacha was a giant in our community, and he was an incredible philanthropist who traveled the world raising money for children fighting polio. He was a proud member of uh, Rotary International. He was uh, the leading light behind Toronto Earls Court Rotary. He and his wife, Peggy, who I'm sure is in tears today, will truly miss him as we all will. Dr. Bocha not only was a dental surgeon and a dentist who uh, provided free service for a lot of people who couldn't afford to pay on a shop on Dufferin, but he also raised tens of thousands of dollars for Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, St. Joseph Hospital, where he worked. He raised money for them. Villa Charities, he raised money for them. Uh, Rotary International, he raised all kinds of money. Never stopped volunteering every single day of his life. A true hero. And heroes like Dr. Bacha don't get the attention they deserve. These are the community leaders that deserve awards. He's also been recognized internationally. And as they say, in Yiddish, he was a true mensch. Or in Italian, he was a gran uomo. <laughs> and as the uh, Rotary motto says, service above self. 
Rest in peace, Dr. Bacha. I thank all members for their statements. It's now time for reports by committees. I beg to inform the House that today the clerk received a report on the intended appointments dated November 1st, 2000.